not there. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Um, in a few moments, I'm going to introduce Joe Becker, and we're going to be talking about a number of things. Um, but before I do, I, I have some shout outs. Um, I'd, hi, not seen anybody for God. Six weeks. Um, was really not expecting me quite so long. The reason it's been so long is I was going to have a show last week um, with Jim McLeod who, from Ginger Nuts of Horror, but he will hopefully be coming back uh, later in the year. Uh, we're planning on getting him back. Um, but I ended up by filming something called Paintball Massacre. I uh, had a wonderful couple of days on Paintball Massacre. That was so much fun. Um, so they're still filming. Um, I. But yeah, amazing time. The other thing I need to do is, we were at uh, Scarefence in Lexington. Uh, I had a really good time there. And one of the things that I got, which I'm terribly, terribly proud, and that's uh, Vincent Price's signature. Obviously not an original, but it's signed by his daughter, Victoria Price, who's absolutely lovely. And as you know, I am a huge, huge fan of Vincent Price. Um, and the other thing is I was given this most beautiful artwork, which some of you may have seen on my profile. That's by a gentleman called Kane. Um, uh, his actual real name's Jack, um, but uh, he, he signs himself Kane. I just thought that was absolutely beautiful. So I wanted to share those two things with you. Um, so yeah, um, let me um, introduce uh, Joe. Uh, let me just click on that. Hi, Joe. How's it going? It's going very well. I, I just can't get over the fact Joe and I were chatting yesterday and he's shaved now. He's beautifully got, he's, you've got this gorgeous moustache. <laughs> I, I did it special for the show. <laughs> Absolutely how, gorgeous. How much do you want for the Vincent Price autograph thingy? Uh, I, that's not going anywhere. That's not going anywhere. You can meet Victoria. Victoria is does conventions. You can get one side definitely to you. I, I, I. As people watchers of the show will know, Vincent Price was my all time favorite actor. Um, just amazing as far as I'm concerned. His daughter Victoria is absolutely lovely. I've got really good fun chatting with her um, when we were at the convention. She's got a gorgeous dog, the name of which I can't remember. But uh, yeah, it was very do, good. Do you remember when he made an appearance on an Alice Cooper album? Do I know? This sounds familiar. Remind me. Yeah, it, it was a song called uh, The Black Widow. And I, I believe it was on the Welcome to My Nightmare album. And uh, uh, I think he does the intro and then he also speaks in the middle of it. But it would be cool if you got a copy of that album and had Victoria sign that. That would be very cool. Very, I mean, I'm a, somewhere I've got Thriller. Um, I've got the original LP right, of Thriller. on that too. Yeah, yeah, because, it, 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 yeah. It, see, now I can I can just channel, his, I've just got his voice. I've, I can't do a Vincent Price impression, so I'm not even going to try. But, uh, yeah. It's all yeah. about the attitude anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so... Now, before we go any further, I know you need to do some shout outs. So let's get those out of the way so you don't need to worry about those. Oh, there's there's lots of people I got to shout out to. Uh, first and foremost would be GHS Strings. Uh, they outfit me with all the guitar strings for every guitar that I have. And you've seen uh, at least a, a portion of my guitar collection. So, you know, that's that's a lot of strings. Um, and, and they're they're great, great strings. I, I've never used anything else. Um, yeah, there's analysis plus cables, which I recorded approximately two thirds of Monster with. I had already started Monster when uh, I hooked up with them and they sent me some cables. And uh, the cool thing about it is that with these cables, when you plug them in, there's something about them that is just noise inhibiting. If you have any noise in the area that you're trying to get rid of while you're recording, and you know, that's the thing that recording ours, at least we're always battling, is you know, how to make things as quiet as possible. Analysis cables kind of came to the rescue uh, in the case of Monster. So uh, all the recordings here on there that are super clean and clear, it's obvious those are Analysis Plus cables. Um, and then obviously Morley pedals, which uh, I've, I've always used uh, Morley pedals. Um, I, use, I use a model of their wah pedal that's not just a wah pedal, but it's also a volume and it's also a distortion. And the distortion in that pedal is just 
crazy sick. I've, I've used that on all kinds of things, including uh, a song called Blues for Drinking, which appears in the movie Elite Floor Massacre too. So uh, definitely, I, I, I gotta say something about those three companies so, you know, right out of the gate. Cool. <laughs> yeah, of course, for me, who's not a, a, a musician, I kind of understood a, a, most of what you just said, but I'm assuming that any guitar player will, you know, would actually understand what you're talking about. Um, so well, any, anybody who focuses on purely just sound recording knows what right. I'm talking about. Even your audio files out there. So. Right, right, right. Oh, cool. All right. Well, it's good that you've, how long have you been working with these companies or oh, working geez. with these products? Uh, Morley and GHS, I want to say a good uh, 15, 15 years, maybe 20 years. I'd have to think about that. Uh, Analysis Plus since two years ago, I believe. So and they hooked me up with really long cables, which that was a surprising thing is that uh, typically the longer your cable gets, the more noise you kind of are going to introduce into the system. Uh, and, and they sent me but two, two or three 20, 25 foot cables. And no, no, not a peep, not a squeal out of them, not a hum, not a rattle, not a pop, nothing. So yeah, that, that's something, something to be said for equipment. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I say that we're not um, the sound quality that you're hearing at the moment, folks. That is not based on that because this is just a phone together for doing the uh, for doing this uh, interview. So, when, how did you get into music? Now, you started at a really young age uh, playing guitar. Yeah. Um, well, basically, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, my dad is a musician. Uh, my uncle Ed is a musician. Uh, my other uh, late uncle, uh, through marriage, Joe Kelly, he was a musician. He was actually the lead guitarist for a band called The Shadows of Night. They did that song Gloria, G L O R I A, Gloria. That was his band. Um, and so, with my dad being a musician, and he was writing and recording music all the time, uh, and obviously he ushered me, he wanted me to be a musician too. I really didn't understand that. Uh, I didn't think the world did anything different. I thought that's what people did. I, I was four years old when I, when I first started. I thought everybody played guitar and that was just life. Um, and it wasn't until I got a little older, people started telling me, you know, what you're doing there is special, uh, especially because I was doing it at such a, a young age. And that's why uh, I, I get phone calls at home from Jonathan Brandmeier, who uh, the, he, he would call me at home and say, hey, but, you know, actually he would call my mom and then she would put, hand me the phone and then, he would ask me to play certain things and uh, that would be that. So uh, it's just been something that I've always been and uh, love to do and it's, it's part of who I am. So uh, and, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, Oops. And Jonathan um, is was a radio host. Is a radio host or was a radio host? Yeah, you, you, you probably wouldn't know because you're on the other side of the pond, mm -hmm. but in Chicago, uh, Jonathan Brammeyer uh, was one of the biggest radio DJs uh, syndicated across the country for uh, not quite a number of years. So to to be on his show was you know kind of fun. Until uh, I went to school one day and uh, I walked into the school. I think I was in third grade, fourth grade, something like that. And somebody, because I had been on the radio early in the morning prior to school. Somebody recorded it, and when I walked into the school, they were playing it over the intercom, which was kind of embarrassing uh, for me at the time. But you know, you, when you're a kid, you you know, the stuff like that you can't quite make all the best sense of. I absolutely. So you, in terms of playing, okay, so you're playing guitar, you're, play, you're occasionally playing it on, and you become a musician. Were you a part of a band, or did you just play sessions, or or how did the career kind of take off? Well, I, I had a couple bands when I was younger, but uh, basically one of the things, and I learned it from watching my dad, uh, and actually I, I learned it with a very specific piece of equipment, uh, which was a Sony TC630 reel to reel. Uh, it has a feature on it called Sound on Sound. So uh, unlike a multi-track recorder that gives you, say, eight or 16 tracks available to record, one part for rhythm guitar and one part for lead guitar and one part for bass, what this thing would do would be allow you to say record on the left channel and then bounce that over to the right channel while you record it again on top of it. And so it was like a controlled bleed, right? So 
what he would do is, uh, you know, he would record uh, rhythm, guitar, bass, and then anywhere from three to six vocals, all using that machine. So it was one person doing all the parts of everyone. Because I learned that methodology, that's the same methodology that I still use today. So uh, when I started making music for sale and for use in, in different uh, uh, publications, basically what you hear you yeah i'm playing guitar and everybody knows me as, as the guitar player but i'm also playing the piano i'm also playing the bass i'm also playing all of the other instruments that you hear so uh when you can do that by yourself you kind of don't need a band and you, uh especially in the business that i'm in you don't need to go and be uh, a road warrior or uh you know go play at a bar or play at a wedding to make your money you, you do what i do so uh you, you know i, I create music uh, that's my music, original music that people buy, uh, and, and it's uh, you know just to support myself as an artist. Then I I record music for horror films, uh, almost exclusively horror films. Although I've I've done uh, some benefits stuff for uh, kids with cancer and things like that. Um, and basically, as a musician, you know you're always creating, kind of like an, uh, any, any artist. Uh, if you were a painter. You do that for your own enjoyment. It, it's kind of like a, you know, part of your soul. You you paint, and uh, you know, a painter winds up with a, a bunch of paintings. You know, at, at some point, I have a bunch of recordings. I think I'm up to uh, almost 200 recordings that uh, that are in my catalog that uh, di different places can use if they want to use them for their film. They can go through my entire catalog and say, I like this piece or that piece or that piece. Sometimes they come to me and they say, I want something brand new, and uh, that's why. I have the studio here so I can do that work. Uh, in some cases, at the end, I'll do something for a film. And if it's not uh, signed away to the film, I can take that piece of music and sell it as my music. And uh, that's also kind of part of the way Monster came uh, into being. Right. So how much... It's interesting to, to listen to you talk about the fact that you're able to work w without a band, um, which is obviously the way that most or many musicians um, uh, go. Do you miss the, the camaraderie of a band, do you think? Or are you just happy being oh. by yourself? No, it, it, it's easier to, for one thing, it's easier to control everything when you're by yourself. Um, and then you don't have to deal with things like people being late you don't have to deal with uh, people being alcoholics or uh, uh, any of the other dynamics, you know, that go with, you know, this person doesn't like that person necessarily. Uh, all that all that goes away. And uh, so not only do you not have to deal with that, but you can execute real quick. Right. I, I was interested because you mentioned earlier on you have a, you've got a large number of guitars. Do you use the different guitars because they produce a different sound or is it just because they feel different or why have you got so why do you have a guitar problem basically <laughs> there's there's a, a method to the madness but uh essentially the reason i have part of the reason i have so many is not just because i love them and you know they're they're what i use and work but i have them all tuned to a different key so uh if let's say i i just have an idea or something I, I can hear it in my head i don't necessarily know exactly what key it's in or, or you know at that moment if i rush downstairs all i have to do is strum every single one of the guitars until i find the right key and then i i'm off and running so there's a mechanical advantage to having as many guitars as i do that is absolutely oh, fascinating oh, you reminded me of an american composer who had a piano um built specially for him, and I can't remember, he was a, a famous American composer from rather like 1930s, 1940s, and he had a lever on the piano that would change the key for him. Um, so, you know, he, he knew how to play music, but he, he wasn't so good at transcribing into different keys. And so he literally just had a lever on his piano so that he could move it and just shift it. And he's like, oh, it actually sounds better up there rather than down, rather than that. So he could just stick with the same fingers on the same keys um, and get it, it out of his head. That's, I, that's really fascinating uh, as to why you got. So now you talked about, you've done over 200 pieces. How do you, and you've talked about, the, you mentioned the fact that you do um, 
film. How do you approach that? Is it normally that people will just show you the the finished film or you know with time codes, etc., and just say, okay, we need music for this bit? Or how do you like to, how do you prefer to work when you're composing for film? Uh I prefer not to work. So I, I prefer that uh my catalog is just reviewed and someone selects music that they can place and they know where they're going to place it. And then that's kind of the end of the story. Um, <laughs> if I am actually working to footage, uh, basically they give me a rough cut, uh, with time code. Uh, and, uh, what I'll do is I'll actually have several meetings with the producer or the director, whoever's in charge of that decision-making and I'll show them options. I'll say, well, when I'm seeing this footage, I hear this, um but what do you what do you think about that do you like that yay or nay and they give me the yay or the nay and we kind of move on from there once i have a kind of uh their vision and we everybody's on the same page about what things are going to sound like and what the music's going to be like then uh basically i start the with their footage imported into my software i use cubase and uh so you know i if their time code is zero 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 that's where i start and I, I record everything and then I export that to either a, a wave or an MP3, uh, whatever sound file that, that they want. And then I send it back to them so that they can then import it with the starting being at zero, 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 and everything syncs up in time. Right. <laughs> uh, I had an issue recently with a film uh, because they didn't have a sound designer and uh, the, the product didn't go through any mastering. And so uh, typically, and I, I've, I've had music in a lot of, of movies so far and a lot more are coming up uh but typically i'll just hand the music over as i've recorded it and somebody on the mastering or the editing end will adjust the bass and the volume and the treble and they'll make sure that it sounds good when you play it through a television set uh, and that didn't happen with this project so now i still have to go back and kind of do that for them i can kind of do that correcting because i have the capability uh but nobody nobody told me they needed me to be the one doing that so I'm just kind of coming in and trying to save the day with, with that. But uh, yeah, normally I just hand the stuff off, and uh, you know, if you if you want to use my music, if you've heard my music, you've seen it in a different project, then here you go. Go through the catalog, pick what you want, and go from there. Give me my credits and whatever else we agreed to, and that's the end of it. Right. right. So do you, you you more predominantly just compose for your uh, like your own benefit for your own enjoyment? um and do you without wanting to pull the curtain too far apart about your process how does what comes first i'm always fascinated is it the music or the lyric uh well the majority of the music that uh i've made that is popular is instrumental uh unfortunately the market for what i'm really good at is died and that's instrumental guitar music like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and all, all those guys, uh, that world has shrunk down to basically those two guys. And, you know, kids today, they're not looking to learn to play guitar. They don't have guitar heroes anymore. They're not into that. What's popular today is things like rap. Um, you know, the, the kids, kids want to dance or something. I, I guess uh, they don't want, they don't want to become the next Eddie Van Halen anymore. So, uh, th there was a time when, the majority of the music that I made was instrumental and there was still a market for it. I caught it at the tail end of the market just before it died, uh, but I had to shift gears. So now the music I'm creating does have lyrics and um, I would say it's probably a 50-50 mix. Uh, when I get an idea, it's either because I have something funny in my head that I thought lyric wise would work or I already have a, a, a musical idea that needs words and so i just follow along with that as i'm playing and i bust out the old pen and paper and kind of go from there um, do you you just write the lyrics down and you may put in some um, some chords when you're doing that you you won't notate it um well no actually uh, it, it starts with uh, the chords uh basically as a musician there's kind of there's always been two schools of thought. You're either classically trained. So, uh, you know, basically you, you cite, read, sheet music and you perform somebody else's music. Creation is very frowned upon. 
Um, if you do understand theory, then you can become a composer and then you write out sheet music and somebody else is playing your music. Uh, or, or you have uh, kind of like how blues and rock started is you're a folk musician and you operate differently that way. So instead of just sight reading uh, sheet music, uh, you memorize very large pieces of music and that's kind of the way you operate. So uh, writing then kind of becomes the same thing. So if I'm going to write a song, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out some sort of chord arrangements uh, and some sort of rhythm that repeats and obviously has, you know, will either bring you to a bridge or some sort of hook um, and, you know, obviously an apex and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'll have that to work with already and then I'll start penning lyrics after that. Right. It's just the way I write. So. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm absolutely fascinated by all this stuff. Um, so uh, we have a good question from one of our viewers, Kim. Hi, Kim. Thank you for joining us. Um, Kim, jo uh, Kim asks, Joe, who inspired you to be a composer? Also, so it's two questions, in fact. So first question, who inspired you to be a composer? Oh, so many people. Uh, uh, initially, it was my dad. Uh, my, you know, I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to do what my dad was doing. And uh, just like the rest of my family who were musicians, you know, uh, that's that, that was my inspiration. Uh, but getting older and then actually uh, analyzing music and studying music and enjoying music, uh, there, there are a few other people that really, truly inspire me. And I have to say today, uh, at my old age, uh, probably uh, Jeff Lynn of uh, Electric Light Orchestra. He's probably my biggest uh, hero when it comes to composing. And if I'm gonna compose something, I'm gonna try and uh, approach it with him in mind. Uh, and then obviously Paul McCartney and the Beatles. Um, I'm, I'm a very hook-oriented person. Uh, so yeah, I'd have to say those two are, are the biggest, biggest ones. Right, <laughs> okay. And in terms of, you mentioned you mostly, um, your music is mostly used in horror films. Do you have a particular favorite horror genre, such as slasher? What sort of horror movies do you enjoy watching? Honestly, uh, I, I like B-horror movies and anything that's kind of is so bad, it's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anything that, that you know th this is why i make uh music for movies like that are called leaf blower massacre 2. if that's any indicator I and mean, you, you could look at some of the other movie titles that i've done uh, you know if it, if it's corny uh, that's what that's what i'm into right the, 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 there are some great movies out there you know there is a very there's a documentary on a leprechaun which they're trailering and just saying that you know if a if a book is bad it's bad but a film could be bad in so many different ways you know that can be can be so bad it's good um right. there is you know, there is a whole genre of films um to me Lazo, uh, was uh the the room um which I'm, i've not seen the film neither the film or the the, the franco biopic um about it that sounds absolutely fascinating cool all right so let's move on to um uh night of the living bread oh, yeah there's there you go that uh, you you know you this is this is exactly what i'm talking about that and that's uh, uh you know basically that movie and and the reason i like it so much is because they really they they they, they jumped on the idea uh, I don't know how many of the viewers know, but uh, uh, Night of the Living Dead is public domain. So you could go ahead and take a copy of, of Night of the Living Dead and you can repress it on a DVD and attempt to sell it and make your money. That's fine. Um, or you can rewrite the movie. You can use the footage for the movie. Uh, they, you, you can do whatever you want with it. So uh, they came out with this movie called Night of the Living Bread. And basically, all they did was replace all the zombies with slices of bread, and it's that simple. <laughs> so, in the opening scene, where you know Barbara, she's in the car and she rolls down the hill and she's trying to get away from slices of bread, and she's locked in her car and she hits the tree and she's looking through her windshield, and all of a sudden, 
you don't see zombies, you see slices of bread piling on top of her windshield. And it, it's like, it was, it's a magic movie moment. I, I don't know, I think it's great. Other people I, I, might go, I, 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 whatever. I, I think oh, it's I'm, absolutely I'm, amazing. I love it. I, um, this is an eight minute short film. Um, they really do the entire movie in eight minutes replacing zombies with slices of bread it you know they've got all the same beats the same points it's shot in black and white it's shot in very similar uh locations to the original and it's it's beautiful it's done with such love um for the original it it really is amazing absolutely amazing and it's available on on youtube um and it was shot in 1990 so it was it was done on film um uh, as, as well and it just looks great it really is it um there was another movie that came out where they did the same thing well they didn't do the same thing they utilized night of the living dead uh but uh, it, and what they called it what it, it at the time it was the world's longest movie title and it was like night of the day of the sun of the dawn of the, the whatever uh uh living dead it was like 20 words long was the title. And in that case, they took the original footage for Night of the Living Dead and they just overdubbed it. And, it, <laughs> and what they overdubbed it with was just crazy nonsense. That's another good one. I'd put those two movies side by side in my movie collection. I, I, I've heard of this. I've, 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 either somebody was telling me about it or I, I don't remember watching it, but I've definitely heard of it. I can't remember who it was who mentioned it, or I it's just like stumbled across it. The day of the dawn of the sun of the living, uh, and then it goes on from there. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> the title is worth it for the title alone. Um, uh, Derek, another one of our uh, regular viewers. Hi, Derek. Um, hope you're well. Um, so, Joe, what is your favorite tune to play just for you? Do you have a favorite tune that you enjoy playing? Wow. Um, there are things that, you know, if I pick up an instrument, they're going to be like the first few things I, I play. Um, an, an actual favorite piece, or piece of music that I like to play. That's a, that's a tough one. I'm sure there is one. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. It, it, it depends. Um, and, and, you know, it, it also depends based on what I'm about to do, because uh, when I was a kid, I, you know, I started very young. Uh, you know, my hero at the time was Eddie Van Halen. I want to be like Eddie Van Halen and uh, play as fast as I could and do all, do all this cool stuff. And then I also got in the blues. And uh, I used to have a, a neighbor. His name was Kevin Paskey. We lived uh, a couple, there were a bunch of us uh, from high, some of us from high school still were friends on Facebook. So I lived on the same block as Joe Walsh and Jeremy Pasternak and Kevin Paskey and Jason Fila and Josh Weaver and uh, a bunch of these guys. But uh, Kevin in particular, he really latched onto my talent for being able to play guitar. And what he would do during the summer is if he had a girlfriend over, he'd bang on my door and he'd be like, hey, we're down by the lake. Can you bring your guitar and can you play music for us? Sure, no problem, Kevin. So I grab my guitar and I go down there and and and, and you know, uh, basically what I like to play for that scenario is much different than like uh, what I would like to play for myself. Well, when I play for myself, I'm, I'm trying to create something. Um, if I'm trying to impress a girl, now my wife, um, you know, I'm going to play something different, right? So uh, that's not an easy question to answer. I, I got to say, great, great question. Uh, and uh, I'm going to spend the next week obsessing over how I could have answered that better. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's always the way. This is what this is what the you know, questions we get asked by these guys are always lovely, le lovely left field questions, um, mm -hmm. which I always find some of the most interesting ones. Um, so okay so uh, night of the living brain uh, thank you derek that, was, that really is a great question okay so i think what i'd like to talk about now is something that happened to your family in fact you think you mentioned your uncle ed earlier on 
yeah. um, which led to a book which he wrote called right. True Haunting, right. um, which then led to a documentary. Well, it uh, and, and basically he, he wrote this sometime after the events um, right. had, had happened. Um, but it led to a documentary, um, and you're saying is now leading on to a feature film. But we'll come back to that later on. Right. But let's talk. Let's start with when did you first learn? When did you first hear the story about the true haunting, and how, how did it first come into your family? We used to talk about it. Uh, basically, uh, this happened in 1970. I wasn't born until 1976. And uh, so obviously, you know, it was still a topic of conversation, but it would come up at like, you know, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthday parties, whatever, periodically. And uh, I remember hearing some of the stories, which were not covered in the documentary because they only had an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like as early as maybe like seven or eight years old. So you can, this was a massive thing that happened. So it, it was every every you know few family gatherings it would come up, and uh, basically, uh, you know, my uncle was kind of ushered into it, write a book, write about it, write about it, write about it, write about it. Right, about right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah. And uh, now, yeah, they're they're going to make a, a major motion picture out of it. I guess he's already signed the the contracts. He's already gotten some of his payments. And uh, but you never know how that can go because they can even buy everything outright and never put it on the shelf. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's so around about eight years old. So you so what it so not everyone uh, will know the story that we're talking about. So what is the story that you first oh. heard? And and let, let's fill people in on what we're actually talking about here. Okay, um, when I first started hearing the stories about it it was about just events that occurred in the house um and so people understand what actually happened i can give a broader view mm. uh, ultimately the, the poor guy bought what is essentially kind of like the most haunted house ever and uh it was out of desperation uh him and his wife were pregnant with my cousin and uh when they announced the pregnancy to the landlord the landlord said uh you know uh, no pets no babies so in other words like get out right so uh they needed to put a roof over their heads and my uncle found a two flat or i don't know what they call them over there but in over here they're called two flats so uh, it's a house but there's an apartment on the top level and there's an apartment on the bottom level uh, he bought that, rented out the bottom level to essentially pay for the mortgage, and then they lived on the top level and uh, found out that the, the place was haunted, and it was so bad that they it actually led to the world's first nationally televised exorcism on NBC. And uh, that seemed to have taken care of things for a little bit, but then I had uh, an aunt get involved and kind of reignited uh whatever was previously there and that got to the point where they just they had to, they had to move out they had to get out and uh i'm not allowed to give out the address of the house but i know the address and when you look this place up it's been bought and sold probably a good 60 to 65 times since 1970. nobody ever lasts there any longer than six months and uh, some of the views of this thing are, are kind of crazy because, you know, it's, it's constantly for sale. So you have those real estate sites that show you pictures of the inside of the house. And it's been modernized. And one of the things that they modernized was they made damn sure they put the biggest windows in this thing that they could to bring in as much light as possible. Uh, and to the point where one of the downstairs bedrooms, when they put a great big picture window in just a small bedroom, uh, it faces the garage. So there's no view. They're not looking at anything. They're just trying to get light in there. And there's a cross on the on the wall above the bed in the in the, the photograph. Now this is today. These events that happened to my uncle were in 1970. So it, you you look at you know the history of of the buying and the selling of the house, and then you add that with the exorcism, and then you add that with the the actual events that occurred, and it's like there's there's some bad juju on that place. It's actually a real haunting. It's it's not uh, 
you know, it was something Hollywood fab fabricated and uh, there's nothing, uh, you know, really the, all that crazy about it. Uh, just that, you know, these things really occurred and a lot of it was caught on film and it was caught by NBC and uh, yeah, it, pretty, pretty scary, scary stuff. It, 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 the documentary. You, you saw the documentary. I, right? I saw the documentary, which was a paranormal. It says it was on Sci-Fi. Yeah. Um, they, 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 you very kindly supplied me with a link. Um, so it, it's um, a drama documentary or docudrama. Uh, we call them over here, where basically they're recreating an awful lot of the incidents that happen. Mm. So basically, as you say, you, your your uncle Ed had to move in with his wife um uh and they had the baby your cousin um and it started as all these things you know things I, there's a lovely thing basically she had a glass candy jar that she put in the center of the table she turned her back on it for a moment and then, then it's at the edge of the table um so that was like one of her prized possessions too so she didn't like that getting messed with no no i could i could it's just and it's really really well done and it, it is quite chilling and the documentary explores um some of the history of the house the family that was living there before um the crazy woman who was there when he went to view the house um it, it's the, the twelve thousand birds that were swirling around the house during the exorcism <laughs> The, the the poor sound guy who's who was the only one in the room. He's like, "Can you hear that?" And, and everybody's like, "No, what are you talking?" About? Like, creepy, just creepy stuff. It, it it it's really. I I can imagine that they're going to make a really interesting um, uh, a film out of it. And it's a basically they invited uh, or or they rented out the uh, the lower room to a couple with a baby as well, um, and she left with the baby first right. before. Um, and then your uh, your aunt April, I believe, um, moved in. Um, but it's 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 if you can find the documentary, it's really interesting. It's very very interesting. I I started reading the book uh, that your your uncle wrote twenty eleven. The book was published. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Um, it, it was an Amazon uh, bestseller in twenty twelve. I know that. Right. Yeah, it, it, I, I got as far as reading the um, uh, uh, the introduction, and he made a very interesting point in the in the introduction. He was saying, uh, "Exorcisms don't work." My, there's exorcising demons, um, but ghosts aren't demons necessarily. Right. And I thought that was very interesting. No, I've never heard that concept before. The idea that you can, you know, because you're exorcising. Demons, and there's a lovely moment in the documentary where the priest is obviously doing going through the motions of this exorcism, and then something happens, and I won't spoil it for you. Um, and he's obviously terrified, and he's just going through the motions because that's what you do to help people who believe that, something right. like that. yeah. Um, uh, that, okay, there's, there's an interesting question just come in from uh, Kim on this topic. What's your personal view of this, Joe? Do you think, okay, again, it's a kind of a double question. What do you think of horror films dealing with the supernatural, such as the Amityville house? Do you believe that a house or objects can be possessed? Um, oh, Man, I have multiple answers to that. Uh, as far as the Amityville horror is concerned, uh, the Warrens, I believe was their name, I, I think they were primarily Amway salespeople. And I, I think the that book in that movie was extremely embellished upon for Hollywood sales purposes. Mm. Uh, whereas the reason it's taken a while for there to be an actual agreement between my uncle and uh, any uh, film studio is that he wants there to be none of that there's he wants them to stay true to the story this is this was real stick with it don't try and do any goofy you know flying slimers like in ghostbusters or anything because none of that happened just stick to what actually happened and uh you know it's truly scary stuff uh do i believe that uh, something evil can attach itself to an entity such as a house or an object yes i absolutely do uh what that is I, I'm not going to say, uh, other than I do believe that there are positive energies and good en en good energies, you, you know, negative, positive, 
they can attach themselves to things and some places can have more of it than others. So my uncle's house obviously uh, had a ton of bad juju attached to it. And the only solution for him was to get away from, from it and you know stop ownership. What was the other question again? Um, well, actually, you kind of asked, you, you, you answered both questions. Um, okay. Yeah, no, you, you, that's a very full and in, in, interesting. I, I'd be really interesting in say, having watched the documentary, uh, if I get the time, I'm going to have a read of the book because it sounds very interesting um, in terms of what's happened and sticking, because it's not, as you say, and that comes, and I think that part of the power of the documentary it's the things that are happen you think well you could kind of explain that away in a kind of a scientific -y way um i i but there's obviously it appears there's more going on i'm well, very it's, with my uncle's house the thing that, that i find interesting is that yeah nearly everything that occurred uh nearly everything could be explained away scientifically, like you said. So you got a creaky house. It's it's not a ghost. You got a creaky house. You got pipes that squeal. Okay, it's not it's not a ghost. It's it's you have pipes that squeal. But the frequency and the nature of it's like if it's like okay, I have a door that opens and slams shut by itself periodically, and the house is creaking, and I hear screaming in the next room, and these things are flying off the, the bookshelves and, you know, the phone just jumped off the hook. And when you have that many things that occur that frequently, it's not it's not the house settling. Mm -hmm. And you just have to admit that there's there's some bad energy there, whatever it is. So my my aunt did the best she could. She got somebody to come and bless the place. And then they did the exorcism. And. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, NBC got involved, and uh, you know, uh, there's there was something wrong. There is something wrong with that house, and so uh, you know, there, there are multiple people that can tell the story. There are the people that lived there at the time. I'm sure there are plenty of other stories that go with that that rental property, which is it, it has remained uh, from every everyone who's attempted to live there. But uh, yeah, it's it's not 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 too cool of a a thing in reality it's not something that should be played with like my aunt tried doing yes yeah, yeah. I, I think that's very interesting part of the documentary as well um about exactly what happened after the couple who were living downstairs and and, and the choices your aunt made um but again you know we're talking about the 1970s it was a different time then right um and i, I, I but i also think it's very much about how we approach the supernatural and our own belief system, et, et cetera. Um, but I did find it absolutely fascinating. Okay, so um, I recommend you find a book called True Haunting. If you can find the it, so your uncle's name was Edwin Becker? Correct. Edwin F. So the book is True Haunting by Edwin F. Becker. Uh, it's available on Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk. It's available Kindle, paperback. Uh, he, he, he published it himself independent, independently uh, because he said he says this in his introduction he didn't want editors going in and saying, well, can't you juice this up a bit? Can't you uh, do that as, as you've been ex ex explaining? Um, so I and it was a very disturbing watch at 11.30 last night through to gone midnight. <laughs> I'm kind <laughs> of glad the only I had to actually sit down and watch it. It's just kind of like, I'm going to have to do this now. Why do I always end up by having to do these things late at night? I don't like it. Um, it is very interesting. Um, so I'd like to talk now about your album, Monster. Yeah. The singular, see, um, well, and, and, and the way you've ordered everything, it perfectly kind of leads up to that because uh, it, that all started with my involvement in horror movies, and then uh, you know every other outside influence in my life. So uh, uh, basically, what that album is? Well, you heard the album. What what do you think the album is? How does how does it sound to you? You gave me a very nice quote for use on my website, which I really appreciate. I did. Um, I, 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 what I said, what I said about it is that it is like 
it's kind of like, and this is not what I said on, on, on the quotation, but what I was kind of struggling for is that there's a kind of, it's like biting into a sugared almond and discovering that, that there's poison in the middle of the sugared almond. <laughs> um, it's, the the music is so sublime. It, it, it's gorgeous music. Um, and it, but the message, the lyrics of what it is you're actually talking about is kind of like, oh, that's not nice at all. So, <laughs> so you, you, but you're laughing, right? Are, what Do you, you see? You see the comedic value in it. Like if it causes you to laugh, and, and that that's one of the biggest things that I've seen is uh, I've played this album for several people. I've had several. It's been peer reviewed several times. Um, uh, first, you get the initial shock. Well, actually, first you get the laughter. Then you get the shock of, wait, what did you just say? You know, are you? And then, and then it turns into confusion. And this, like, I, I kind of want to sing along with this, but I, I don't want to say what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is, so it's it's kind of like, uh, it, it was one of my homage to, uh, to some of the music that my dad did when I was younger. Uh, he did a form of death rock, which was very interesting. Uh, and uh, some of those older, like 70s and 80s death rock performers, like Alice Cooper. And uh, it, actually, I kind of designed the, uh, some of the things that I actually did uh, based on things that Alice Cooper had done. So there's a song on there called Anita. And uh, for this album, Anita serves as uh, Stephen, what Stephen was on it, Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare. So, and that album is, you know, it, it's a concept album. It tells a story from the first song all the way to the last. I tried doing that as well. Obviously, I'm not Alice Cooper, so I can't do it as good. But uh, I, I gave it, I gave it a go, and that's so that's that's what's there. What it was, you, you mentioned Anita. Do you have any other favorite tracks from the album? Oh, I love everything on <laughs> on the album, every single thing. Um, which one do you think would, would you do as a single? Which one would you think would probably stand alone best as a single? Anita. I like Anita. I think Anita is the, the, the one of the That or When a Bone Breaks. Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> I have the children singing along and everything. So, yeah. <laughs> It, 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 it's really good. And where where can people listen to it? Uh, anywhere they can listen to or buy music. It's available at every single outlet. Uh, iTunes, Amazon.com. Uh, I, I don't know. Where do people... I steal most of my music, so I, I don't know. I don't... <laughs> where, where, Shame where, where, on you. Shame <laughs> no, on actually, you. The, tr the truth is I don't listen to any real modern music, uh, so I listen to the old stuff. So, they're, you know... I, I'm still at home listening to Billy Joel and, uh, you know, the Beatles and things like that. Uh, you know, Electric Light Orchestra, Jeff Lynne, the Traveling Woolberries. That's the stuff that gets me going. And, uh, you know, so and that, that's, uh, you know, part of my inspiration for, for working is I want to make something that sounds beautiful. Whether I'm talking about cutting you into pieces while I'm making that is, you know, that's a whole different topic. Right. But it's, it sounds beautiful. You've, you've, you've just reminded Great. me, I, I've got Great. some Billy you, you heard you heard Prelude off of Monster. That's that's the second song. That's all entirely piano. That's another one of my favorites because it sounds so pretty. Yeah, you know, it's there's, not pretty. There's it's certainly there's acoustic piano, and I'm trying to remember. I haven't had a chance to listen to it in the last few days. Um, how much of it is acoustic and how much is electric? Uh, it's just a, an acoustic piano in my voice. That's a, that's all uh, track two is. Track one is just disturbing. Then the music kind of really starts at track two, and that's you know that's another one of my favorites from that album. But I mean, really, the whole thing is a work. It says a lot. It tells a story. It says a lot, and uh, each piece is kind of functional. I've had people email me and say, like in the case of Prelude man, I would love to sing that to this person or that person or the other person. They can't because it's so disturbing and wrong, but, you know. I had uh, I had a reviewer tell me that the album was perfect if 
you wanted to threaten someone and you wanted them to leave you alone permanently and never contact you again, take some of those, take any one of those tracks and send it to that person and they will leave you alone. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 this is kind of like that thing. I love, I love the music. I hate the lyrics. Um, but it's <laughs> <laughs> No, you don't. You love the I kind of hate, you just want to I hate you for making me love, you know, making me love it so much. And they're very catchy to songs as well. I remember we listening to it and going, I really want to get that tune out of my head now. I don't want that as an earworm. I really don't want that as well, I'm really good. I'm really good at getting the tune stuck in your head. Yeah. So I, I used that mechanism to get something else stuck in your head. And then, yeah. yeah, it's stuck yeah. there. It's, it's your problem if you can't get it out. Get it surgically or whatever. I um I yeah, in case you haven't guessed, folks, I really enjoyed. I actually really did enjoy this album. Um, it it, it it's very good. It's monster singular. Um, from Joe Becker. Um, iTunes. Uh, the usual, the usual legal places where you can purchase and give Joe money for his work. Um, because I'm all supportive of that idea. Um. You've been. You mentioned other films. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Leaf Blower Massacre too. Um, it's something that is that out? That's coming out soon, or uh, is it, that, that just came out? Uh, it's hitting uh, several different types of shows. Uh, there, there's different uh, film venues and things that that, that it's appearing at. Uh, it is available on DVD. You need to go buy that. Uh, that that also has a great it has a great scene by Joe Di Bartolo. Uh, I'm not sure if you know him. I think you might. Uh, he's, a Chicago, he, he's a Chicago-based actor. Um, he was in some of those older TV shows about the mob. He plays you know he typically plays like a mobster. Uh, in this movie, he plays a bum. And uh, you know yeah, I did the music for the whole whole film, but uh, in that case, what it was was. Uh, he has one big scene in the beginning where as a bum, he's walking down the streets of Chicago looking for food and he's digging out of dumpsters, looking at, you know, it basically eating other people's throwaways. And uh, that scene actually uh, uses one of my songs, which came out, what, in 2005, I think it was, which is Blues for Drinking. And the music and the cinematography, everything, his acting, everything, it all goes together. To me, that's a magic moment in that film. Um, yeah, so there's that. There's Muerte Tales of Horror, which is coming out uh, very shortly right now. It's playing in several different theaters in Texas, uh, and I believe it's getting released through Cinema Epoch. Uh, and I think you know who they are, too. Um, and speaking of, uh, you know, those uh, movies that are so bad, they're good. Uh, I, have a, I have probably half a dozen movies that are on Cinema Epoch. Uh, two of them are from a guy named Gino McGahey. Uh, they were his first two movies, and uh, one of them is called Rise of the Scarecrows, and that has been labeled the best, worst movie of all time. So I'm really happy to to have music in that. Um, and I have another, there's another movie that's uh, currently, uh, I think they're in post-production by now. I think they have maybe one more shoot, and they're going into post-production, and that would be a movie called Bottom Creek. And... Uh, Basically, I, I don't even want to tell you what that's about because when you go to look for it and you see the the artwork for the movie, you'll know what that's about. And uh, that's another really, you know, disturbing storyline. And uh, I think they're using two of the tracks from Monster in that movie because obviously right. Monster is extremely right. disturbing. So, you know, that, that those two things go together. Yeah. Um, gosh. I don't know. I, I probably have another. I, I'm probably failing people right now because there's probably another half dozen movies that I should be pushing that are either out now or coming out now. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank because I'm into so much, uh, and so I'll obsess about this for another week as well after we're done. <laughs> <laughs> this, that, and the other thing. I, I mean, your website is JoeBecker.com. No. No, it's uh, it used to be JoeBecker.com until I did not uh, pay for the registration of the URL on time, and some Chinese company stole it, and they've been trying to charge me five thousand dollars in order to get it back ever since. So I changed it to JoeBeckerMusic.com. It's one word: JoeBeckerMusic.com. Right, right. JoeBeckerMusic.com. 
I'm going to wait until you forget to pay for Nicholas Vince <laughs> and then I'm going to buy it and be like, all right, $5,000, pal. And then I think, dear God, I've got it on auto renew. It right? should be on auto renew. Like the, you know, poverty can always hit, and you know, I don't have the money in the bank account. That can always happen. Uh, yeah. Actor, you know, that's easily going to be, you know, that can easily happen. <laughs> um, but then, you know, you're you're on a hiding to nothing anyway. If I can't afford to, I can't afford to pay anybody, you know, five thousand dollars to get it back again. Um, right, we're we're near it. We are not at the end of the show yet. We're nearing the end of the show. We've got time for one more question from Kim. Uh, Joe, do you like heavy metal? Uh, music, uh, as some have uh, horror themed lyrics, bands such such as Black Sabbath, Dio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Absolutely. Um, basically, well, if you go to my website, you'll see I've I've kind of I try to touch everything. So I've done uh, classical music, I've done pop music, I've done blues music, I've done rock, I've done metal, I've done neoclassical, I've done neoclassical speed metal, I've done. You, you know, from one end of the game to the next, and I'm still going. I'm trying to touch everything. My next thing is going to be country. Anybody who knows me, think, you know, they know that that's, you know, going to be very interesting. Uh, but, uh, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't listen to uh, kind of any modern music, really very little of it. The, the ones that I do are doing throwbacks to the, the previous eras. Those are the guys that I like today. Uh, but you know, modern music, modern metal, if they're calling it metal, I, I don't see anything that's very metal about it, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. There's lots of those guys that, you know, Dio, Sabbath, Sabbath was like, you know, I mean, truth be told, Ozzy Osbourne's a really cool guy. He, it sucks that he's done to himself what he's done to himself. Uh, you know, but it is what it is. No, I, I love all that stuff. And uh, what's great is that I kind of get some of those accolades in these movies, and I've never talked about that. Uh, so I'm typically not the only composer on a film. There are a few where I am, uh, but really, you know, these filmmakers,